All right, guess we can start. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to this talk. It's great to see so many Java developers interested in what's new in Java in 2018. So many, they had to move us to the big room, so that's very cool. Thank you. My name is Miro Tsupak. I'm uh, with a Toronto-based company called DNA Stack, where we've developed a cloud platform for genomics. And if software development in genetics is something that you're interested in or curious about, please come find me after this talk. Because this talk is not about the domain. It's about the underlying technology stack, which, of course, is Java. As I'm sure many of you know, since last year, Java has been on a six-month release train, right? Which means that, that this year, we get two new releases of Java. We got Java 10 back in March, and we got Java 11 about two months ago. And that, of course, is a much higher frequency than what we're used to, right? Java 9 came out about three and a half years after Java 8, which came out about three years after Java 7. So quite a drastic increase in delivery frequency for a programming language. And that, of course, is a good thing. It's always good to deliver more frequently. Um, what this also means, however, is that JDK 10 and JDK 11 actually have a lot fewer features. And those features are comparatively smaller, which is even more emphasized by the fact that these were the first two releases under the new release schedule, right? On top of that, many things that were introduced are kind of internal. They're not really visible to application developers, or they don't have big impact on our day-to-day -day coding. So we're not going to talk about those. What we are going to talk about are features that affect many of us, so primarily enhancements to very popular APIs, uh, as well as language features. So we're going to do this talk in two parts. In the first part, we're going to talk about APIs. So we're going to cover enhancements to four existing APIs, which is collections, strings, optionals, and I.O., or NIO, as well as one completely new API in JDK 11 which is the new HTTP2 client. And in the second part, we're going to talk about local variable type inference, which arguably is the biggest feature we got in Java this year, and it affects every single one of us. So it's definitely something that's worth talking about, and we'll talk about it in a slightly different way. You will see what that means later on. Now, before we go any further, there's one thing you should know about me. I'm bad at making slides. So I've prepared exactly three slides for you today. This is one of them. <laughs> and this is another one of them. And as this slide suggests, the rest of this talk is going to be basically a live demo. I like learning through examples, so I'm going to write many of them throughout this talk. And I'm going to write them in JShell, which is Java's implementation of a REPL that we've had in Java since version 9. If you haven't seen JShell before, don't worry about it too much. It's extremely easy to figure out, so I'm sure everybody will know what's happening on my screen. So let me just switch to JShell here. And I hope the font is big enough and everything. If not, please do complain. We will fix this. So let's start the way people usually start coding, with a simple Hello World program, OK? I'm going to create a class here. Let's call it Hello DevOps. And I'm going to implement a pretty classic Java main method. Public static void main, which takes some arguments. And then I'm going to print out a simple hello world. So system out print line, hello DevOps. And let's close this and close everything else. And now we have a simple class here. So what I'm going to do now is save this class into a file, uh, let's say hello devox. And notice here that I'm not naming this file using typical Java conventions, right? It's not a Java class. I'm naming it uh, essentially as a script because we're going to see a tiny little feature from JDK 11 that actually makes Java a little bit more script friendly, if that makes sense. So let's exit, let's exit JShell here and let's go to where my script is. So if I take a look at it, it's exactly the same thing that I had in JShell, right? There's nothing sneaky happening here. Well, what's interesting about Java 11 is that before this release, the Java launcher had basically three modes. It could execute a class file, it could execute the main class in a jar file, or it could execute the main class in a module. Well, since Java 11, we have a fourth mode. We can actually execute a class that's in the source file directly. 
So what I can do here is I can just call Java. I can tell it, OK, this is a source file, Java version 11. And I can just run my program here. So that's pretty cool. What's actually happening here is that this compiles the file into memory, and it executes the first class that's in this file. right? Uh, you can even pass arguments to it. You can pass arguments to both the Java launcher. You can tell it things like, this is my class path, this is my module path. But you can also pass arguments to the class itself, which would translate to pretty standard you know, arguments to the main method. And it even supports shebang. So if I actually uh, take a look in my class here, and I edit it, and just add kind of a pretty standard shebang line, user bin Java, and again, this is source of version 11. I can even run this like this. Okay, so nice little addition to Java. It's very useful if you're new to the language, you're just learning Java. You don't have to go through all the ceremony of understanding how to compile and run and everything. But it's also very useful when you're just writing really small utility programs. And it can be kind of the first step towards bringing Java closer to a scripting language, or at least making it a bit script friendly. But let's get back to our JShell here. And let's take a look to the first API. So the first API is collection. And Java 10 and 11 basically made it easier for us to use immutable collections in various different contexts. I'm sure everybody is familiar with how immutable collections work in Java. If I wanted to create one prior to Java 9, in Java 8, I would do something like this. I can create a new array list, let's say, of type integer, and let's call this a list and actually make this an interface. Then to add a couple of elements, I would maybe do something like this. Let's say one, two, three. And now finally, to make it immutable, I would call collections unmodifiable list and give it my list here. And also, let's assign this to my original list. So this is what we had to do in Java 8, right? And there are a couple of issues with this approach. First of all, it's pretty verbose. I needed, what, like five lines of code to create a very simple collection? And the fact that it's not a one-liner, it's a bit annoying. For example, if we have static collections, we have to use static initializer box, which, of course, is not ideal. It's also not truly immutable. This is more like an immutable view of the underlying collection. So if I kept the reference to the ori original list, I would still be able to modify it, which is why this pattern is very common, right? I grab it in an unmodifiable list, and I assign back to the same variable so that I lose the reference. There's also performance overhead associated with this approach. I had to create all these extra objects in the process, and there's performance penalty for supporting mutability in the underlying collections. So this wasn't ideal. And the trouble in Boral Play doesn't add here. If I wanted to copy this list, for example, uh, a very natural approach would be to use uh, the copy constructor. So let's just use new array list here, again, integer, and let's give it our list. And let's call this list2 and make this, again, an interface. But the list2 here is now an array list, right? Which means that it's mutable again. If I try to add something to it, it's going to work just fine. So if I wanted to make this immutable, I would again have to wrap it in collections, a modifiable list. So more, more boilerplate here, right? Just like that. So you can try to get around it. You know, There's methods like copy in the collections class that, well, it, it has kind of a weird syntax, and it's prone to runtime errors if you don't set up your destination correctly. And it also only works for lists, so it's not very universal. So we have this boilerplate problem, right? Which has two parts. There's creation of immutable collections, and then there's copying of immutable collections. And Java 9, of course, helped us to fix the first part of the problem, right? Java 9 introduced static factory methods on all the main interfaces, list, set, and map, which allow us to create truly immutable collections using the off method. So if I wanted to take advantage of this feature, I can just create my list like this. And of course, if I try to add something to this list, this will complain because this is truly immutable. So that's Java 9, right? The API is pretty similar for set and map, so it doesn't probably make sense to go through that. Java 10 fixed the second part of this problem, the copying problem. So Java 10 introduced a copy off method that we can use to create immutable copies 
of other collections. So I can, for example, run copy of list and uh, let's assign this to our list two. And now, if we try to add something to this list, again, the copy is immutable, right? There's, uh, there's similar methods for set and map, and we can actually use them to convert between collections as well. So if I wanted to make this a set, all I need to do is actually just call copy of on a list, and this is going to work just fine. For a map, of course, um, this is a bit different. If we take a look here, it doesn't actually take a collection. It only takes another map. Because, yeah, it's hard. It's easy to convert between maps. It's hard to map it to some other type of collection, right? So it's just a, kind of a convenience thing. And that's not all. Java 10 also tied this nicely with streams. So it introduced collectors to immutable collections. So now, if I had a stream, let's say I'll just create one from this list, I can just call the method collect and give it to unmodifiable list or set or map. And this is going to work very nicely. So that's Java 10, right? We can create copies of collections, and they play nicer with streams. Java 11 extended this a bit further as well, and it made collections a, a bit nicer to play with arrays, if that makes sense. So for example, in Java 11, I can do list to array, and we take a look here. This method is overloaded. There are three versions of it. And the last two were actually present prior to Java 11. The first one, and the most flexible one, is this one here, which is, of course, new. So uh, uh, what this means in practice is essentially, before Java 11, if I wanted to convert a collection to a typed array, I would have to do something like this. I would have to give it an array uh, of integer, probably pre-initialize it with something, maybe something like this, and run it. And this works, but it's not exactly pleasant to read, right? There's, a, there's quite a few brackets and stuff like that. So with Java 11, we can actually make this nicer. And thanks to the new method, we can just use a method reference here. So we can just do something like this. And that's pretty cool. It's just a little bit nicer, a little bit cleaner, a little bit more flexible. And basically, it's a little bit better for consistency with other APIs. For example, the stream API had such a method before as well. And it's a pretty useful method, right? You, you're often in a scenario where you need to convert from a collection to an array, and this is a very nice and convenient way of doing that. So that's the collections API with some sprinkles of streams and arrays, right? Java 11 also enhanced strings. So I'm pretty sure everybody understands strings in Java. No need for an introduction here. Let's just create a very simple string and uh, let's say hello. And let's add some white space uh, before and after the string, maybe something like this. So we have a simple string here. Java 11 added six utility methods to strings. The first one is the method repeat, which takes an integer and basically repeats the string the given number of times, right? For example, if I put 10, I get a string like this. This is pretty common in libraries and other programming languages. If, you, if you're used to Groovy, you probably recognize the multiply method, which is essentially the same thing. We also have a method called lines, which splits the string by lines. And this actually returns a stream, so if I wanted to print this, I can just call something like this. And we have a string nicely split by lines. And then we have four methods that help us deal with white space. That's why I put, strategically put the white space into my string here. We have uh, a method called strip leading, which removes white space from the beginning of the string. Similarly, we have strip trailing, which removes it from the end of the string. And then, as you would probably expect, there's also a method strip, which removes it from both ends. There's actually also a method called is blank, which basically checks if the string is empty or only white space. And the way this is done is it actually uses a method called isWhiteSpace on the character class, uh, which we have here. And it behaves pretty much as you would expect. So new lines, uh, carriage returns, tabs, spaces, and a couple of interesting Unicode characters, they all translate to white space. By the way, this reminds me of uh, another thing that was added in Java 11, which is not necessarily a part of the string API, but it's also a very little kind of utility thing. And that's the not 
predicate. So we, if we have a stream, let's say a stream of strings here, and we want to filter it, maybe just use the method that we've just learned, you know, string is blank, and let's just print everything. Uh, sorry, was there a question? Oh, you, oh, I see what you mean. You want to push this higher. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, if I can grab it. This, is this good? All right. Sorry about this, I wish you, got said, you guys said that earlier. Uh, that's all right. Okay, so where, where was I? Printing a string. All right. So, we have easy filtering using a meta reference. That's very nice. Um, if I wanted to negate this and filter strings that are not blank, I would probably have to rewrite this to a lambda, right, to express the negation. So I would do something like this and add the not here, right, which is slightly less clean and slightly harder to read. But now, with the new not predicate, we can actually just use this. And it's nice and easy and very easy to read. OK. So these are some utility methods for strings with a touch of streams and predicates, right? Another API that plays very nicely with streams and was actually used to make the streams API a bit more robust is optional. Optional got a few enhancements as well. Optional is something that was introduced in Java 8, and it's basically a container that may or may not contain a value. Uh, it, its goal is essentially to reduce the number of places where a null pointer exception can be thrown. The basic API is pretty simple. I can create an empty optional, or I can create an optional containing something. And that's pretty much it. What we also had in Java 8 were a couple of methods for dealing with default values. We had the method called or else, which checks if there's a value in an optional. If there is a value, it returns it. If there isn't any value, it allows us to provide a default value to return. Maybe something like this. There was also a more flexible method of this, which is called or else cat, that actually takes a supplier. So we could do something like this. So that's, that's Java 8. What Java 9 added is the method or, which basically allows us to do the same thing, but not on a value, but rather on an optional. So we can use this to return a default optional, maybe something like this. So this method essentially checks if there's a value in an optional. If there is a value, it returns the same optional, otherwise the default optional that we give it. So we have Java 8, default values, right? Java 9, default optionals. What's missing, default exceptions. And that's what was added in Java 10. So in Java 10, we can actually uh, use the method, actually, let me just scroll here, we can use the method or else throw, which basically checks if there's a value in an optional, if there is a value, return it, otherwise throw a no such element exception. And that's pretty much it. It's just a nice little addition uh, to the optional API. So that's Java 10. Java 11 made a little contribution here as well. Basically, what we had available in the API before was uh, the isPresent method, which checks if there is something in an optional. What was added in Java 11 is kind of the opposite method, is empty, and there really isn't more to it. It's just a nice convenience thing. Uh, the nice thing about this is that it kind of improves consistency with other APIs in Java. For example, collections and several other things in the JDK had an is empty method. So it's kind of nice that optional has that as well. All right, so we have optional. What else? Well, let's talk about I.O. and N.I.O. There are basically three categories of additions to these APIs that I think are worth mentioning here. And the first one are static factory methods for null writers, readers, and streams. So starting with Java 11, I can create a null reader which uh, basically reads no characters. Uh, it essentially behaves as a stream that's open, but we've reached the end, right? Similarly, we have null writer, which basically discards everything that you give it. And we have null input stream and null 
output stream, which are essentially the same thing, but for bytes, of course. So how is this possibly useful? Well, essentially think about it as Java's version of DevNull, right? If you're in a situation where you just want to discard all the output or you want to have an input that's just empty, this is what this is for. So it's, it can be useful in tests. For example, you don't want to use a real input stream. You just want to use uh, some sort of a mock. The second addition here are a couple of factory methods on the path class. So if we take a look here, we have the method off, which, well, there are two versions of it. It takes a string or a couple of strings, and it takes a URL, and it can convert them into a path. So if, if I express the path to, to my original script that we wrote at the very beginning of this, uh, I can just do this here. We can now call this a path. So this is quite useful because there are many APIs in the JDK that use strings for allocating resources, and there are many APIs that use paths for allocating resources, and this allows you to convert between the two. It actually, this plays very nice with another new feature in JDK 11, which is uh, in the files class. So we have two new methods here. We have a method called read string, which basically reads a file into a string. It's actually a very nice little convenience method here. So I can just give it my path here, and it's going to read my whole script. And similarly, we have a complementary method, write string, which can replace this with some string. Of course, if I read it again, it's going to be that new thing. We also have another little convenience method, which allows us to compare two paths in the sense, do these things point to the same file? So if I create a second path here, let's call this path2, I can call files is same file and my two paths, and this, of course, is true. This is actually very effective. In this case, it doesn't even check if the file exists. It just knows that these objects are equal, so it's going to return immediately. All right. So these have been some additions to existing APIs in Java, right? Typically very small things, but because these APIs are used really widely, this can actually be quite impactful. We also have one new API in Java 11, and that's the new HTTP2 client. The new HTTP2 client basically replaces the old HTTP URL connection API, which was very unpleasant to use. So it's a very good thing that we finally have this in the JDK. Uh, and it supports all the cool new things. It supports HTTP2, supports WebSocket with TLS, supports server push, proxies, cookies, basic authentication, everything that you would expect it to support. So I'm going to credit this to Java 11 because that's where, when this became a stable part of the API, but it has actually been around since Java 9 in the form of an incubator module. The implementation was essentially completely rewritten in the process of the incubation, so I think it's completely fair to credit this to Java 11, but just so that you know. So to demonstrate the client API, I'm going to need a server, right? And if there's anything that I've learned from doing live coding at conferences is that you can never rely on the internet there. So I'm going to create a very simple local server here in Java. I actually really like this example because I think that many people don't realize that we have this API in the JDK. You can actually very easily create a very simple server. So I'm going to create the simplest possible server, OK? It's going to have a single endpoint. And no matter what kind of request I send to this endpoint, it's going to respond with a fixed string. All right? So let's start by declaring the handler for my endpoint. Let's call this handler. And this is going to do a quick lambda. It takes an HTTP exchange. And well, the lambda is actually not that quick. It's going to be a multi-line lambda. So I'll start by declaring the string that I want to return. Let's call it hello devox. Then I will set the response headers. I'm always going to respond with 200. Everything is OK. And the length of my content, which is the length of my string. And finally, I will open an output stream uh, assign the response body here, and I will use this output stream to write my string to the response. Okay, so I will just call the method write, which of course take the string, takes the string, and this is an output stream, so we have to do this through get bytes, but that's okay, and let's just close everything. So this got a bit unreadable, so just let's take a look at this and see if this works. Yeah, this looks like a pretty reasonable handler. So let's try and create a server here. 
Uh, I'm going to create a new HTTP server. Uh, this takes a port. So let's give it a port, let's say, 8,000. And it will need the backlog. Let's call this HS. Now I can create my endpoint, let's say, slash hello, and attach my favorite handler to it. And finally, I can start the server. And hopefully, the server works. Now, to verify this, I'm, of course, going to need the client. So let's take a look at the new client API. The new API is built around three main classes, well, four if you count WebSockets. But there's HTTP client, HTTP request, and HTTP response. So it's pretty self-explanatory. I can start by creating the client. Let's say uh, HTTP client, new HTTP client factory method. Let's call this HC. And I can take a look at the version here, and you can see that this really supports HTTP2. To be fair, I'm not really taking advantage of this in my simple example, but it is there. So now, let's create a request. And this actually uses a builder pattern, so I can just obtain my builder here. Uh, give it a URI to my local server. Uh, so this is going to be something like HTTP uh, localhost. I believe I used 8000 slash hello. And let's make it a get request and call the build method here. Now let's call this a request. And now finally, I can use the client to send the request to the server. And this also takes something called body handler here. And in this case, I'm just going to tell it to treat everything as string. And thankfully, there is a built-in handler for this. So I'll just do this, and let's call this response. And now, the moment of truth, let's see if this works. Status code, 200, looking promising. Body, hello DevOps. So now we have a server and a client. They're both working and communicating over HTTP2. All right. So this wraps up the first part of the talk, which was quite a lot of work for me, frankly. So now it's time for you to do your work. So in the second part of this talk, it's going, we're going to talk about the local variable type inference, right? As is typical with Java features, this is not a revolutionary concept, right? Java tends to be very conservative when it comes to adopting new features. And this is something that many other languages have had for a very long time, Scala, C Sharp, you name it. In fact, what Java 10 adds is a very limited form of type inference. It essentially only takes a look at variable assignments, and it determines the type on the left side, the type of the variable, by looking at the initializer on the right side. That's really what this is about. It's limited by design so that the functionality is not abused. So the goal with this was really to improve uh, developer productivity and experience by reducing boilerplate. So since Java 10, we can declare local variables using the var keyword. It's actually not a keyword. It's something called a reserved type name. But regardless, it's var, and we'll see what that means a bit later. So I could, of course, you know, create string in the old Java. But now I can replace this with a var, and this is going to work just fine. We're not getting rid of types or anything like that. If I take a look at this variable, you can see that it was correctly inferred as a string, right? This is just inference. We're not sacrificing static typing in any way. So if you're seeing this for the first time, you're probably thinking, this might be a bit sketchy, right? There's probably some scenarios with like more complicated polymorphism where I can create a use case where this is not going to be inferred correctly. And you, you would be actually right, which is why there is a very specific set of restrictions and rules for when you can use this. So let's examine these in the second half of this talk. And let's do this as a quiz, OK? So in the next uh, 25 minutes or so, I'm going to show you 35 very short code examples, OK? Sort of rapid fire examples. And for each one of them, I'm going to ask you a yes, no question. The vast majority of the time, this question is going to be, will this compile? OK? And I'm going to ask you to raise your hand when you think this, if this will compile, and then raise your hand if you think this doesn't compile, so that we can see how well you do as the audience. What I will also ask you is to count the number of questions that you get right, or write them down to your phone or somewhere, so that at the end, we'll do a final poll, and you can compare how well you did to everybody else 
in this audience. Okay? Ready for this? 35 rapid fire questions. So obviously this is a new feature, right? So th this tests more your Java intuition than anything else, but I think it can still be fun. All right, question number one, generics. That's right, diving right in. So I'm going to create a simple array list here, let's say array list of string, and I'm going to assign it to a variable called list, just like this. Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? Okay, vast majority of people think that this will compile, and you're exactly right. Nothing sneaky happening here. Um, in fact, this is kind of what the feature was introduced for. Uh, really, when you're working with generics, types can get relatively complex. You can easily imagine that you have, let's say, a stream, and you're trying to break it apart in some local variables, or maybe you have a map of an object to a collection of other objects. The type can get pretty long. And this helps a lot with this. And it also align, allows you to align everything on the left side. So it's kind of nice for readability. So if we take a look at this list, you can see that it was correctly inferred as array list of string, right? But there's one slightly strange thing here. If you were writing this yourself, you probably wouldn't make this an array list. You would make it a list, right? You would code to the interface. Well, that's not how it works here. Type inference always infers the most specific type, right? So just be careful about this. Don't just upgrade to Java 10 and just replace everything with var, because it can potentially break your code, right? If I was relying on this, just being a list, and later I assign, let's say, a linked list to this, then, of course, my code would now break, because this would be just an array list. To be fair, this is very unlikely to affect you, because what the feature was designed for is just variables with a very limited scope. So it's very rare that you would actually reassign these kind of variables. But it is something to know of. and pay attention to. OK, question two, declarations without explicit initialization. So of course, this is valid Java code, right? So my question is, will this compile? Who thinks it will compile? Who thinks it will not compile? OK, so it's probably 1910 for no. And most of you are correct. This will not compile because you cannot infer the type of the variable. Basically. This was a design decision, right? Uh, of course, the compiler could infer the type of the variable, right? The compiler sees your whole program, so it couldn't run any sort of sophisticated analysis that it wishes, and it could correctly determine this type. It just, it was deemed as too, too extensive and possibly confusing. Basically, if you're not giving it a type, you probably don't know what you want it to be, so we're just not going to infer everything. It's just, just a design decision. OK, so question three. How about we initialize it now, since the, it didn't work without initialization, but give it a null. Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably 80-20 for no. And yeah, this will not compile. And the reason is basically the same as in the previous case. Uh, we just don't know what this variable was intended to be. It's actually a bit tricky here. Uh, basically, null is the only value of what's called a null type in Java, which is the type that the compiler uses. If it's not visible to us, we cannot declare something of a null type directly. But it is there. So in principle, we could infer it. And there is a very special property of this null type, right? Aside from the fact that null is the only value, it's also the only type that's a subtype of every other type, right? So we have a couple of options for inference here. We could infer it as a null type. But the problem with this is that then we could never assign anything to it, right? Because the only value is null. So that's not very useful. We already concluded in the previous example that we don't want to infer a very specific type because it's presumably too complex. So then we're left with an object, right? We could potentially make this an object. But then you're in a situation where later you might assign a string to it, and you would expect the string to work normally. Like you, you, you would expect that you're able to call standard string methods on it. But of course, it's an object now, so we'd have to cast it, which would be really annoying. So basically, they just decided to not allow this. So since the issue in this case was that we don't know what type it is, how about I explicitly tell it that this is an integer null that I want to have here? Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? OK, probably 90-10 for saying this will work. And you are correct. The issue really was in the previous case that we just didn't know the type. So if we give it a type, this is going to work just fine. 
All right, question five, compound declarations. Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, compound declarations. Of course, this is valid Java code, right? Uh, I can do something like this, and this is going to work just fine. My question is, will this work? Who thinks it will? Who thinks it won't? Okay, I would say that's an overwhelming yes, but in reality, this actually doesn't work. Uh, var is not allowed in a compound declaration. Uh, essentially, it was decided that this possibly is too confusing, so it's just not allowed. Okay, how about methods, right? Question six is going to be about the method. I can create uh, a simple, let's say, increment method here, which is going to take an integer, and it's going to return that integer plus one. So this is normal Java code. This, of course, compiles. How about if we replace the argument with var? Who thinks this will work? OK, a couple of people who thinks this will not work. All right, probably 90-10 for no. And yeah, this doesn't work. And basically, you know, this has to do with overloading. You want to be very specific when you're overloading methods. You don't want to rely on any sort of inference. All right, so it doesn't work with arguments. How about return types? Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably 80-20 for no. And indeed, var is not allowed here. Basically, it's not allowed anywhere in methods. And that's probably a good thing. OK. So what can we do now? Well, let's take a look at for loops, for example. I will create a sm simple for loop here. Pretty standard stuff. Uh, let's just start with 0, uh, less than 100, for example, increment, and just an empty for loop. Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably 90-10 for yes. Yeah, this will compile. It's actually something that I explicitly mentioned in the jab. This is a feature that this was designed for. You want to be able to use it in for loops. How about for each, then? How about we create something like this? Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? OK, interesting. We have probably about 70-30 split. Uh, most people think this will work. And yeah, of course, it will work. Again, something that's explicitly mentioned in the, in the JAP, something that the feature was designed for. Question 10, primitive types. I can declare a short like this, right? What happens if I do it like this? Will this work? Who thinks this will not work? OK, a couple of people think this will not work. This will actually work, but there is a, a tiny little catch here. If we take a look at this variable, it was inferred as, a, as an int, not a short. And that is something to pay attention to when it comes to primitive types. There are a couple of primitive types, like short, byte, etc., that all infer to an int. OK, so just be careful uh, about this. It can potentially infer to the wrong thing. How about uh, hexadecimal numbers? How about we do something like this? Now, I'm going to tell you that this will compile. What I'm interested in is what, the, what will this be inferred as? So we have two options. It can be an int, or it can be something else. Who thinks this is going to be an int? OK. Who thinks this is going to be something else? OK, probably 60-40 for something else. Uh, if we take a look here, it is actually an int. Th I mean, this is a standard Java thing. We can specify integers this way. There's, there's nothing sneaky happening here. What I was trying to build up to towards is actually something like this. I will add one more digit here. And what's happening now is that my integer was pushed above 32 bits, right? So this doesn't fit into an int anymore. So my question right now is, is this automatically going to infer long, or is this going to fail with an error? Who thinks this will be a long? Who thinks this will be an error? OK, probably 50-50. Uh, 
uh, this is actually an error. It just expects an integer. The type inference doesn't go into this depth. It doesn't like analyze ranges and that sort of thing, right? If I wanted to make this a long, I could add a, this, and then it would be inferred as long. But I would have to specify this explicitly. OK. Question 13. Fields in a class. Let's create a simple class here. Uh, let's call it my class. And let's add a field and properly initialize it and everything. Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK. Again, probably 50-50. Quite a large number of people who did not participate in this one, I've noticed. That's a smart move. You, you don't miss 100% of the shots you don't take, right? Yeah, this, this doesn't work. Uh, really, this was meant for local variables, so they specifically chose not to allow it in the place of fields. OK, so now we have this new reserve time name, right, var. So a very natural question to ask is, how about I name some things the same way, right? In other words, can I do this? Can I have a variable called var? Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? OK, probably 90-10 for no. But actually, this does work. <laughs> we can have a variable named var. And this is actually the important distinction between a keyword and a reserve type name. If this was a keyword, this would not work. But because it's a type name, this actually does work very nicely. OK, so we can name a variable var. How about the method? How about I do something like this? Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? OK, I would say probably 70, 30 for this will work. Yeah, it will. Same thing as with variables. Uh, nothing sneaky here. OK, so we've tried methods. We've tried variables. How about classes? How about I name a class var? Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? OK, probably 50-50. Actually, no, it doesn't work for classes because it's a type name, right? In fact, this explicitly tells you, JShell tells you here, that if this was Java 9, this would be working. This would have been fine. But starting with Java 10, this is no longer allowed. And this was just deemed as an acceptable compromise because it, basically naming a class like this breaks so many naming conventions that probably nobody does this. So we'll just accept this breaking change and we'll just do this fine. OK, so that was question 16. Question 17, is this case sensitive? In other words, will this work? Can I get around the problem? Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? OK, overwhelming, yes. And you are right, of course, Java is case sensitive, so this will work. Not the greatest name, but it will work. OK, question 18, I've done classes. How about enums? And I don't mean the name of the enum, because that, that would be the same case as with a class, of course, that would work. But how about I use var in place of a key in an enum? Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, I would say probably 60-40 for no. This actually works. So here we go. Basically, same scenario that we had with variables. This will just work. OK, question 19, arrays. Let's try a very simple thing. Uh, let's uh, declare an array like this. So I'm, I'm using var in the place of an element of an array here. Let's just say something like this. Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? Probably 70, 30 for this will work. But no, not really. Uh, var is not allowed in place of an element type of an array. And this is a bit tricky. Um, basically, uh, the problem that we have with arrays is that we don't necessarily know what kind of an array this is just by looking at this here, right? Like, this can be shorts, this can be bytes, this can be integers. So there's actually type inference happening with this already. So if you, if you specify an array, it takes a look on the left side and tries to infer the type of the right side from the left side. But now if we've added new type of type inference, right? 
Now we put it on the left side as well. So now this is trying to infer from the right side, and the other thing is trying to infer from the left side. So to break this cycle, we're basically going to disallow this. OK, so it doesn't work as, as elements of an array. How about, how about the whole array? How about I just do this? Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably 60-40 for yes. No, doesn't work with whole arrays either. Uh, yeah, basically, same thing as before. We need an explicit type. OK, how about I try something else then? How about I initialize this like this? Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, overwhelming yes. And you are correct. This was actually really surprising to me. But it does tell you in the previous case that this needs an explicit target type. And we do give it an explicit type here. So yeah, that's exactly what it wanted. And it does work now. OK, question 22. Let's try this with try and catch. So let's try try, try first. Let's do something like this. I'm going to uh, correctly initialize this and everything. And then I can catch an exception. Uh, let's say something like this. Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? OK. Overwhelming yes. Uh, yeah, it will work. You can use local variables in try blocks. Nothing stinky there. How about catch blocks? How about I do this? Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, overwhelming no. And that is correct. Var is not allowed in the catch, which kind of makes sense, right? If you think about it, error handling is a very important part of your application. And you want to be very specific with what kind of exception you're catching, especially given the fact that they all inherit from the same class or the interface. So yeah, doesn't work in catch, but of course, works in try. 24, lambdas. Let's try to create a simple supplier, for example. Let's call this s and just do maybe something like this. Very simple supplier, just returns a string. Obviously, this is normal Java code. This will work just fine. But how about we do this? Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? OK, probably 60-40 for no. And yeah, indeed. This doesn't work because lambda expressions need an explicit target type. What we have here is basically the same situation we had with arrays. Lambdas need something on the other side to infer the same way arrays did. And now we have type inference on this other side as well. So there's kind of like two type inferences clashing. So we're not going to allow this. So it doesn't work with lambdas. Well, how about lambda parameters? How about I create a simple consumer here? And let's just say, you know, maybe print out this variable, something like this. This is normal Java code. This will work. How about we use var here? Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? OK, overwhelming no. But in fact, this does work quite nicely. It is a bit tricky, though. To be fair, if I was running Java 10 here, this would not be working. But because I'm running Java 11, this does actually work. In other words, this was a new feature that was added in Java 11. That this type inference was kind of extended to this context. And if not, it now works with Lambda parameters. The motivation for this that they described uh, in the chat is basically allowing us to apply modifiers or annotations to Lambda parameters. Right? If we have var, we can add annotations, which can potentially be useful. Personally, I'm a bit skeptical. I don't think I've ever been in a situation where I wanted to apply an annotation on Lambda parameter. But I guess time will tell whether this is actually useful. I think the other argument that you know, you could use var everywhere else with local variables. So for consistency purposes, it makes sense to use it here. I think that's a bit more valid. Maybe consistency was the real reason here. So anyway, it does work with lambda parameters. Let's try having multiple lambda parameters. I'm going to create a by consumer here and add the new thing here, new variable. Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? OK. Um, yeah, probably 50-50 split. I mean, th there's really no reason why this shouldn't work. This is the same case as before, right? It's, we just have multiple things. What I was trying to build up to is actually mix and matching this. So what if 
I use explicit var with one of them and just implicit lambda with the other parameter. Who thinks this will compile? A few people. Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably 70, 30 for no. And yeah, uh, very good call. You cannot mix var with implicitly typed parameters, as it tells you. OK, I mean, it emphasizes implicitly, right? So a very natural thing is to try and mix it with explicit types. How about this? Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, there's a, a slight slight uh, tendency towards yes. But no, cannot mix var with explicit parameters either. There's just a sneaky error message a bit here. But yeah, this doesn't work. OK, getting towards the finish line. Question 29. Let's create uh, another Lambda, this time in the form of a meta reference. Let's create a consumer here. Uh, it's actually just a refactoring of our previous consumer, which is going to do something like this, which of course works, but let's change this consumer to var now. Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? Okay, probably 90-10 towards now. Yeah, this will not work. It didn't work with lambdas, right? So there's no reason why it should work with method references. I was just trying to trick you there. Uh, but yeah. Okay. So, example 30, uh, diamond operator. So we've done array list, right? Where I've explicitly told it on the right side that it's an array list of string. So let's try it with just a diamond. Let's say I'm just going to create a new array list like this, and let's make this a list. Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably 90-10 for no. This actually works. Uh, but yeah, however, if we take a look at this list here, it's inferred as an array list of object, which realistically is something that you never want, right? You would probably never want an array list of objects. So it is a bit confusing. Um, it, it's kind of tricky, right? If you think about it, all the other rules that they're taking here are basically trying to avoid a situation where we get something that's not very usable, right? But this clearly is not very usable, yet they allow this. So. The reason for this, I mean, I assume the reason for this is that I, I think that if we introduce diamond and type inference in the same release, maybe this would not work. But diamond was present here before, and there were already cases where diamond resulted into a, an object. So for consistency purposes, we kind of had to go with it. And that's why this works like this, right? It, it's basically, it is an explicit initializer, so we kind of have to make it work to be at least sort of consistent. So yeah, that's the issue here. So how about I pre-initialize this diamond list uh, with something of a specific type, let's say numbers? OK. So I'm, I'm going to tell you right away that this is going to compile. What I'm interested in is if we explicitly give it integers through some other collection, is this going to transitively infer a list of integers? Who thinks this will be in an integer now? Who thinks this will be an object? OK, overwhelmingly, towards an object, uh, if we take a look here, it is an integer. So type inference is that smart. Like, it can look past this, and it does know the correct type in this case. So it is actually quite sophisticated. OK, how about we change this a little bit here? How about uh, we just use the raw type? Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? OK, maybe 70, 30 for yes. Uh, yeah, this will work. And it's just going to be a raw type. Raw types are types, like any other types. So this is completely fine. OK, let's take a look at capture variables with, uh, or you know, types with nasty capture variables. What I'm going to do here is create uh, a small list, let's say a list of integer. And I'm going to call this list1. So we take a look at this list, actually list one. Uh, we can see that it's a pretty standard list of integers. Nothing sneaky happening here. I can try to extract an element from this list. Uh, let's say zero. 
and let's call this x, and let's use var. Still, nothing sneaky happening here. If we take a look here, it's, of course, correctly inferred as an integer. But now, I'm going to create a second list, a list of unknown. And I'm going to call this list 2 and assign all the elements from my original list to this list of unknown, right? So if we take a look at this list 2, it is really just a list of unknown, OK? So now, let's do the same thing we did before. Let's extract an element. And in fact, why don't we go one step further? How about I, I try to add back this element that I've just extracted? Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? Yeah, so this doesn't work. And the reason this doesn't work is essentially we take a look at this x that we got from our list of unknown. It's an object, right? So object is potentially something higher than our unknown. So we were trying to add it back. It just doesn't work, which kind of makes sense. But I just wanted to point out the very specific rule that is in place here. Basically, whenever you use capture variables, they are projected to their super types. So that would be a bound or quite often an object if you don't specify anything. So just something to think about. OK, last two examples, very quickly. Anonymous classes, OK? One thing that's known about Java is that it strategically chose uh, not to implement a tuple, right, or a pair. So let's try to create our own. And I can do this very simply just by creating an object uh, and use this as an anonymous class. I can just add a couple of attributes. So let's say A is going to be 1, and another attribute B uh, is going to be 2. So that is a very simple anonymous class, and let's assign to our variable x. This, of course, works, right? That's pretty standard. The question is, can I access this attribute now? Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? OK, probably 70, 30 towards no. But yeah, this, this actually works. Uh, you can access the elements. I have a very simple implementation of an anonymous class. Uh, no big deal, right? Well, it is actually kind of a big deal. Um, so this is a pretty nice, very concise implementation uh, of a tuple. But I bet you've never seen this in an actual code. And you've never seen this because this actually didn't work prior to Java 10, right? So if, I, uh, if we take a look at the variable here, it's something really weird. It's an anonymous class extending object. That's what this gets inferred as. So this is something that we didn't have before, right? If I was in Java, in Java 9, for example, and I wanted to assign this to a variable, I would have to make it an object. Because an anonymous class belongs to the group of types that are called non-denotable types, which basically means that we, we cannot name them. We cannot explicitly uh, you know, name them, for example, when we're declaring variables. So my only choice, because an anonymous class doesn't have a name, would be an object here. And then, of course, if I try to access the attribute, this doesn't work, because object has no notion of A, right? But with type inference, this gets inferred to something slightly more specific than an object that knows its attributes, so we can actually access this. And this is a good property to take advantage of. It allows us to do more things. I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that, because it will be very confusing for whoever is reading this code if they're not familiar with this specific situation. But it does work. Uh, so be careful when you're using this with anonymous classes, right? Uh, this shows that. Uh, Type inference is not just a kind of a syntactic trick, but it can actually change the semantics of our programs. And finally, last example here, intersection types. Um, let's create a very quick method that uh, creates an intersection type, because intersection types are also non denotable types, so I cannot declare them directly. So I'm just going to create a generic method here that's using a type parameter, returns uh, something of that type, and let's call this make intersection type, and let's just make it return null, OK? So what I'm doing this, I'm basically just casting null to t. And I'm going to doing this through a method so that I can specify an intersection type. Intersection type is probably something that you may not know by name, but you might have seen this construct before. It's something like this. I can extend multiple interfaces or classes uh, in this type, so I can, for example, specify something like this, right? So this is a valid method. It just casts null to something that has multiple 
kind of upper bounds, if that makes sense. So the question here is, if I create a new variable and assign the output of this method, uh, will this work? Who thinks it will? Who thinks it won't? OK, overwhelming no. But this does actually work. And if we take a look at this variable, we can see that it, it is of this non-denotable type that we would not have been able to declare otherwise. So it's basically the same situation we had with anonymous classes, right? Type inference exposes something more that we didn't have access to before. So that's everything I had. These were all the 35 questions. So let's see how well you did, OK? Who got more than 15 correct? Raise your hand. OK, I would say maybe 20% of the audience will park. How about more than 18? This is more than 50%. OK, several people. More than 20? OK. How about 25 or more? OK, about five people. How about 30 or more? OK, I don't think I see anyone. So we're somewhere between 25 and 30. 28 or more? Two, one, two, three. 29? OK, so everybody is at 28. We have about three people who got 28. That is very, very good score. Congratulations, guys. Very good.